The F-16, like all fighter aircraft, had its origin in the skies over France during the First World War. It began when some pilot or aerial observer first took aloft a gun, as well as his camera. In the far off happy days of World War I, where they staggered off in these aeroplanes with open cockpits and no guns, and they had a pot at each other with their pistols. And then they waved, off they went back to their various aerodromes. And then, of course, some shit invented a machine gun firing forwards. And we started killing each other. And there's the trouble. From this beginning, the fighter aircraft evolved. And with it came a new type of specialist, the fighter pilot. They were the top of the line, 20th century knights in armor, armed with the best aircraft and technology their country could offer. As in every human endeavor, some people are more skillful than others, aces in their field. An ace fighter pilot is one with at least five combat victories. Becoming an ace requires many things, opportunity, skill, aggressiveness, and a good airplane. The first pilots to achieve ace status were those of World War I. And we happened to be a bunch of people who fought the first aerial warfare in the history of mankind. They claimed in the early days uh, they'd wave at each other, but it wasn't done in my time. There's only two things there. I killed him or he killed me. W.C. Bill Lambert was America's second-ranking ace of World War I. In three months, he scored 22 victories, placing him just behind America's number one ace, Eddie Rickenbacker. Bill had luck, he had skill, and he had a great plane, an SE-5. The SE-5 was strong, fast, and agile. I could twist it inside out. I could land it on a dime. I could climb her up in a loop, half roll out of that loop, never worry about a spin. As any, I'm saying my particular aircraft that I worked with, that I flew with, was as maneuverable as anything the British had. Although the Camel has a reputation of being out maneuvering for near anything. The Sopwith Camel that Bill mentioned and other excellent fighters began to appear over the Western Front. French Newports and Spads, German Fokker D7s, Albatrosses, and the famous Fokker triplanes flown by World War I's top ace with 80 victories, Germany's Red Baron, Manfred Baron von Richthofen. Richthofen was so sure that he had cold turkey and that camel out there in front of him. I don't know what's the matter with him, because I never saw him on our side of the lines before, never. But he chased that camel. Result was, he was about 10 miles back of our lines when he was shot down. He got on my tail once, but I managed to get away from him. By the end of the war in 1918, the airplane had progressed from a novelty item whose role was uncertain to a useful weapon of war. One German ace in particular, Hermann Goering, saw the aircraft's importance clearly, and one day he would command the most powerful air force in the world. Between World War I and World War II, several regional wars broke out. In 1936, Spain was torn by civil war. Germany's volunteer Condor Legion was sent to fight in Spain for Franco's nationalist forces. Adolf Galland, who would later become a fighter ace with 104 victories and Germany's youngest general, saw his first combat in Spain. I flew the Heinkel 51 biplane, but this was uh, at the time already an obsolete fighter. And therefore, we used it only for direct support, strafing, and uh, bombing. The Spanish Civil War marked the end of the biplane era and the introduction of a new design era in fighters. 
cantilever monoplanes with retractable gear and enclosed cockpits. Innovations not entirely well received at the time. Uh, fighter pilot in a closed cockpit is an impossible thing because you should smell the enemy. You, you could smell them because of the oil they were burning. <laughs> Two of these new fighters were the Russian I-16 and the German ME-109. In an air war fought with a very limited number of aircraft, their impact was surprising. Very surprising, especially Messerschmitt 109, even in their first version, were superior to everything that flew in Spain. By the mid-30s, uh, Germany's dictator Adolf Hitler had begun to build an air force of huge proportions, the Luftwaffe. It was commanded by Hermann Goering and heavily staffed with Condor Legion veterans like Galan. For this new force, Messerschmitt would continue with the development of the ME-109 and a twin-engined escort fighter, the ME-110. They would clash with British Spitfires and Hurricanes when Hitler's Luftwaffe and England's Royal Air Force met in what will forever remain the classic air war, the Battle of Britain. Wing Commander Douglas Botter, who lost both legs in a crash in 1931, returned to the RAF when World War II began. The first of his 23 victories was over the Channel during the evacuation of Dunkirk. I shot one fellow down at Dunkirk. He was, must have been a beginner like myself because he stayed flying absolutely straight and never while I shot him down, you know, without moving. We didn't have air superiority, that's, uh, so, but we had enough. The Germans uh, left Dunkirk and went on to, to Paris and so on, which was a great mistake of theirs, really. We lost quite a lot of aeroplanes at Dunkirk and some jolly good pilots. But uh, they managed to get back quite 300,000 men, I think, from the beaches. There's a lot of people. It was actually dead calm sea. Robert Stanford Tuck, an RAF ace with 30 victories, also got his first kill at Dunkirk. Botter and Tuck both flew hurricanes and Spitfires, but the Spitfire was their favorite. On the Spitfire, and the Spitfire was a very small, very dainty, very maneuverable fighter. Your cockpit fitted you like a glove, and your instruments and everything was right to hand immediately. It was small, fast, and strong, and good arm. Patriots of the countries overrun by Hitler's Blitzkrieg made their way to England to fight against the Luftwaffe. Among them was Norway's leading ace, Sven Hegland. Now a major general in the Royal Norwegian Air Force, Hegland had 16 victories in World War II, four of them at night. We started off with uh, hurricanes and uh, later uh, converted to uh, Spitfires, the earliest Spitfire, Spitfire Mark II. I think uh, Hurricane was that are adapted to ground support work and uh, to work. It, it carried quite a heavy load. And later on in the war, they uh, installed, I think, four 20-millimeter uh, guns in it and used it for strafing work. Spitfire was not a fighter. Uh, the turning ability, of course, on the Spitfire was very good, and you, uh, you could rely on that to outturn the Germans. The Germans never could outturn us. So they uh, very often throw over, uh, if they want to get away, they turn on the back and dive straight down. Germany's ME-109 compared well with the Spitfire, but had its shortcomings. I flew the first one we captured in 1940 at Farnborough, which is a test establishment for us, as you know. And we did a comparison trial between this first Messerschmitt and uh, an E, Messerschmitt E, and a Spitfire Mark II. They were very comparable in their performance, but I thought the 109 going downhill fast was very stiff on the control. 
there is too much metal strutting and reinforcing around, which restricts your vision very, very much. Unfortunately for Germany, their twin-engined ME-110 proved to be a mistake. The Germans thought it was very good. Actually, it was an absolute gift for a, a single-engine fighter. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the Lightning was uh, an equal mistake. The P-38 P pilot uh, are angry with me about this skating town. <laughs> The ME-110 was a mistake. The Focke-Wulf FW-190, introduced in 1942, wasn't. Botter describes the reaction of Johnny Johnson, the RAF's top scoring ace, to his first encounter with the FW-190. Johnny came back in his chaps and he said, we met a, a, a new German airplane which had a round engine and uh, squarish wingtips. And it, it outmaneuvered and, and was better than the Spitfire Five in every respect. W what was it? And the Amnesty Intelligence came back and said, we think it must have been some old Curtis aeroplanes the Americans sold the French, which they're using. And so Johnny said, well, if they've got some old Curtis aeroplanes as good as that, can we have some, please? Anyhow, they discovered, I mean, a few weeks later, there was, in fact, the Focke 190. Now, uh, what they did then, uh, the British manufacturers, they engined up the Spitfire, and the, um, it was a Spitfire 9, and the Spitfire 9 reigned supreme for the rest of the war. It was better than the 190. It outclimbed, it uh, did everything. Though taking somewhat of a back seat to the events in Europe, there was nevertheless bitter resistance to the Japanese tide that swept the Pacific after Pearl Harbor. Among the first to meet the Japanese head-on was David Lee Tex Hill. Tex scored 18 victories against the Japanese and originally commanded one of the Flying Tiger squadrons in China. The famous shark mouth P-40s of the Flying Tigers weren't entirely a match for the highly maneuverable Zero. Japanese aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, no way you'd shoot him down. The minute you'd close on him, why, well, he'd immediately pull it into a, a, a steep turn and you couldn't pull enough deflection on him to get him. Yes. And uh, he'd be right on your tail, you so we'd roll it over and dive out. Yeah. But with the two ship element and you could single one Japanese out, you could catch him and he would fly along and be watching you, and when you got within range, why, then he'd maneuver. Well, in this case, your wingman would drop back, and then when that Japanese maneuvered, why, I'd put a very low angle on him, you see, and he'd get a head-on shot on him. So that's the way we compensated against the maneuverability factor, because we had the other two, the speed and the firepower. But to work this tactic requires a two-to-one numbers advantage. The world's top scoring fighter ace, Germany's Eric Hartmann, summed up the quality versus quantity problem very well as, Fila Hunsin de Hasentot, too many hounds are the death of the hare. That means that one duck never catches a rabbit. But if lots of bugs are behind one rabbit, then they got them. Hartman's experience as a fighter pilot ranges from 1941 to 1970, when he retired after flying jets with a new Luftwaffe. In World War II, he flew over 1,400 missions, had combat in more than half of these, and shot down 352 enemy planes, all on the Eastern Front, all while flying the ME-109. How did he achieve that many victories? have to no clouds, try to, to get in the sun, and start from the sun you attack. Do you have clouds? Then I tried uh, to go downstairs, that I have the enemies here in the sky under the clouds, and try to get 
exactly under the air blade, and then come up with full power. And he cannot see you because he has wings, he protected you. You get them down. And the next step is go away after you get the skill and watch again the whole area what's going on and decide for another one or go home, make a coffee break. I told my pilots always, only if the windshield is filled up with the enemy, then pull the trigger. It saves you a lot of ammunition. And a lot of ammunition was going to be needed. New generation American fighters were phasing into the conflict, including two truly great fighters, the P-47 Thunderbolt and the P-51 Mustang. Hartman and his men began to meet the Mustangs over Romania. Above 15,000 feet, the Mustang was superiority. But if you get down the Mustangs below 15,000 feet, then the 109 was better, I found out. The P-51s were superior at altitude. Not only that, they came in great quantities. It was the P-51s that inspired his analogy of the rabbit. They were more. We had to fight with four and eight airplanes against a couple of hundreds. Not too much to do for us. With equipment that is more or less equal, then quantity and aggressiveness will tip the balance. And the P-51s, P-47s, and the Spitfire 9s, in quantity, turned the aerial tide in Europe. The aggressive spirit abounded in America's top ace in Europe, Francis Gabreski, who also became an ace in the Korean War. In World War II, Gabby flew Spitfire 9s, P-51s, and P-47s. Spit 9 was uh, designed principally as a fighter interceptor, and it was a, just a tremendous airplane in that particular role. However, it had its limitations. It didn't have the range. It didn't have the endurance. So as an escort airplane, all they could do is escort probably to the coast of France and back, and that's about all. And that's why we came in with the P-51 and the P-47, plus the P-38. I would say for the long range work, the P-51 is probably a uh, better airplane because it had greater range than a P-47. P-47 had its uh, limitations. And that's, that's the part that the P-51 played in the European theater. But we had eight machine guns in the P-47, which was tremendous firepower compared to the six machine guns that you had in the P-51. And there was no other fighter in the world with that amount firepower. It was a sturdy airplane, built like a tank, and I could drive it through most anything. It was more than a match for the Focke Wolf uh, 190. It was a more than a match for a 109. We had water injection that uh, would with sustained power keep us there for about three minutes up to five minutes, depend, uh, depending upon how you use it. But it gave us that tremendous edge that we needed against the German Luftwaffe. But this was the twilight of the piston engine fighter's day. The Luftwaffe soon made a quantum jump in performance by introducing the ME-262, the first operational jet aircraft. The performance and the flight characteristics were so overwhelming. The impression of jet flight first uh, in a pilot's life is something extra. But uh, when Hitler saw this aircraft first time presented, he asked Messerschmitt, I was present at this time, is this aircraft able to carry bombs? And uh, Messerschmitt yeah, said yes. And Hitler asked, how many kilos? I said, uh, perhaps a 500, uh, but for sure a 250 kilo bomb. And Hitler said, uh, this is the 
Blitz Bomber, as she called it, the uh, dive bomber, the, the fighter bomber, uh, which I'm requesting since years. With uh, this aircraft, I can, I can fight the invasion, the coming invasion. And this was uh, the sentence to death for this aircraft being used as fighter, as interceptor, what it really was. And Galan so bitterly opposed using the 262 as a bomber that Hitler eventually relieved him of his command of the fighter force and gave him instead command of a handful of 262s to use as fighters. We have built a total of about 1,250 of this aircraft, but only 50 were allowed to be used as fighters, as interceptors. And out of this 50, there were never more than 25 operational. If we would have the, the 262 up to our disposal, we could have had in 44 at least 300 operational. With this, we had, would have stopped the American day offensive. That's for sure. Of course, the outcome of the war would not have been changed. The war was lost, perhaps, when it was started. The war was lost, and Germany surrendered in May of 1945. But in the last months of the air war in Europe, Galan and his men had definitely proven the effectiveness of the jet-powered fighter. But uh, I think this was a new, unique situation. We had to our disposal the first operational jet uh, which superseded for at least 150 knots the fastest American and English fighters. It's a new, unique situation. This will only come if you have a, such a revolutionary uh, change in technology like the jet has brought about. That superiority did inspire a complete change in fighter design. And by the time the Korean War broke out in 1950, most of the fighters involved were jets. Once again, the struggle for air supremacy began, this time between US P-80s and F-86s and MiGs, Russian fighters supplied to the North Koreans. Ralph Parr, a double ace in Korea, compares the MiG-15 to the F-86. The MiG had a smaller wingspan, was shorter, smaller all over, therefore harder to see. Uh, it could turn tighter, it could out-accelerate, it could out-decelerate, uh, it could climb higher, and it had, uh, for a while there, it had better than a 2,500 foot per minute rate of climb advantage, and it had bigger guns. It did not have a radar gun sight, but it had a computing gun sight, I believe. And uh, generally speaking, one of those advantages the MiG had will normally work for you in combat. The F-86 was a, a real joy to fly. I mean, it handled well, uh, held up well. It felt good. Uh, it responded well. But the, uh, when it comes into how do you overcome some of the advantages of the MiG had, uh, you had to predict what the other guy thought he was seeing. And you could suck in the MiG pilot uh, in frequently. To a, to a point whereby you were going to get a good shot at him before he got away. You'd give him something and pull it away from him. In other words, uh, he's looking at your left hand when your right hand's the one that's going to hit him. I gave four of them the first shot in order to get them in close enough where I could hammer them before they got away. And all four went down. The, uh, I guess the closest shot I got was about 15 or 20 feet. And uh, the furthest shot out I got and still hit was uh, about 4,300 feet. There were pilots that I encountered that were as good as any that I have ever seen any place. And I have to assume from the intelligence reports and so forth that I have uh, uh, seen that the Russians were training the students at a certain point when they brought them in the combat. And the Russian pilots, every now and then, 
would break away and really encounter our forces. And they, 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 they were very good, very good. However, the Korean pilots were in training, and it was quite evident that they were not seasoned pilots. And as they build up their confidence, why, every now and then they would tangle with us. I think that we were, uh, we shot down just about eight MiG-15s for every F-86 that was uh, shot down. The combination of a great fighter and a well-trained, experienced pilot is unbeatable. And it was this, more than anything else, that allowed the F-86s to dominate the MiGs in Korea. The best fighter aircraft in the world is no better than its pilot. Aces, perhaps, are really made in training. The first Air Force pilot to become an ace in the Vietnam War was Steve Ritchie, who flew the F-4 against the excellent MiG-21s. Ritchie also stresses training. We are reaching the limit of the mental computer in the cockpit in the air war. Uh, therefore, it is more important than ever before that training take place. And it takes, in my opinion, a good five years, a good five years of steady, regular training to reach the type of proficiency that a fighter pilot must have in today's arena. Most of the Air Force MiG battles in Vietnam took place in 60 to 90 seconds or less. Everything that a fighter pilot has worked for, trained for, learned, studied over a period of 5, 10, 15 years has to come together and work in an instant of time. And in that life or death instant, the pilot should also have the best possible fighter aircraft. The aces all have pretty much the same idea about the characteristics of their ideal fighter. A good single engine airplane that had all the bugs worked out of it. Oh, I don't hold too much from twin engines because if you get hit in a, in a really combat, in one engine, and the one engine exploded, then normally the second engine exploded too. Make a small, strong, powerful aircraft. The smaller that you get, as long as you can perform the mission, the better, the better off you are. Because you make for a smaller target, and you make for a smaller uh, radar cross-section, which means that you're harder to pick up. The stable platform for your weapons do you yeah. need the maneuverability you need. Uh, you need a good strength of your structure. Yes, build it so strong it won't break. That's all I want the modern fighter to be. <laughs> uh, I would like to have had uh, more power. Uh, an airplane who climbs very high, highest altitude as possible, maybe today in the space, who is very maneuverable and who has a higher speed. I think we can use our technology to simplify and have, have sophisticated equipment, and yet advances in technology can make it easier to use in the cockpit, cockpit in the arena, and more reliable. And reliability uh, is something that we've harped on for years and years and years. I think I mentioned earlier that in the F-4 over Hanoi, seldom, did everything work on the airplane? Seldom. Even if it's a very high, highly sophisticated aircraft, a very good aircraft, it's no good if you, if you come below a certain number. So uh, you have to have the numbers. And, uh, and then it's a matter of what, uh, your purse string. I mean, how much can you afford? In looking about the fighter forces that we have in being today, I would say that we're doing the right thing. We're trying to build numbers as well as quality. A small, rugged aircraft, fast and maneuverable, with good acceleration, firepower and climb. An uncomplicated single engine fighter with a price tag that allows it to be bought in large quantities. A tall order, this ideal fighter of the aces. But the F-16 fulfills this ideal. Truly a fighter pilot's fighter. The 
the F-16 is a fighting reality, creating new aces, continuing the tradition of great fighters. <laughs>